Chapter Three of Indian Child Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Indian Child Life by Charles Eastman. An Indian Sugar Camp. With the first March thaw, the thoughts of the Indian women of my childhood days turned promptly to the annual sugar making. This industry was chiefly followed by the old men and women and the children. The rest of the tribe went out upon the spring fur hunt at this season, leaving us at home to make the sugar. The first and most important of the necessary utensils were the huge iron and brass kettles for boiling everything else could be made but these must be bought begged or borrowed a maple tree was felled and a log canoe hollowed out into which the sap was to be gathered little troughs of basswood and birchen basins were also made to receive the sweet drops as they trickled from the tree as soon as these labors were accomplished we all proceeded to the bark sugar house which stood in the midst of a fine grove of maples on the bank of the Minnesota River. We found this hut partially filled with the snows of winter and the withered leaves of the preceding autumn, and it must be cleared for our use. In the meantime, a tent was pitched outside for a few days' occupancy. The snow was still deep in the woods, with a solid crust upon which we could easily walk for we usually moved to the sugar house before the sap had actually started the better to complete our preparations my grandmother did not confine herself to canoe making she also collected a good supply of fuel for the fires for she would not have much time to gather wood when the sap began to flow presently the weather moderated and the snow began to melt the month of April brought showers which carried most of it off into the Minnesota River. Now the women began to test the trees, moving leisurely among them, axe in hand, and striking a single quick blow to see if the sap would appear. Trees, like people, have their individual characters. Some were ready to yield up their lifeblood, while others were more reluctant now one of the birchen basins was set under each tree and a hardwood chip driven deep into the cut which the axe had made from the corners of this chip at first drop by drop then more freely the sap trickled into the little dishes it is usual to make sugar from maples but several other trees were also tapped by the indians from the birch and ash was made a dark-colored sugar with a somewhat bitter taste which was used for medicinal purposes the box elder yielded a beautiful white sugar whose only fault was that there was never enough of it a long fire was now made in the sugar house and a row of brass kettles suspended over the blaze the sap was collected by the women in tin or birchen buckets and poured into the canoes from which the kettles were kept filled the hearts of the boys beat high with pleasant anticipations when they heard the welcome hissing sound of the boiling sap each boy claimed one kettle for his especial charge it was his duty to see that the fire was kept under it to watch lest it boil over and finally when the sap became syrup to test it upon the snow dipping it out with a wooden paddle so frequent were these tests that for the first day or two we consumed nearly all that could be made and it was not until the sweetness began to pall that my grandmother set herself in earnest to store up sugar for future use she made it into cakes of various forms in birchen moulds and sometimes in hollow canes or reeds and the bills of ducks and geese some of it was pulverized and packed in rawhide cases being a prudent woman she did not give it to us after the first month or so except upon special occasions and it was thus made to last almost the year around 
the smaller candies were reserved as an occasional treat for the little fellows and the sugar was eaten at feasts with wild rice or parched corn and also with pounded dried meat coffee and tea with their substitutes were all unknown to us in those days every pursuit has its trials and anxieties my grandmother's special tribulations during the sugaring season were the upsetting and gnawing of holes in her birch bark pans the transgressors were the rabbit and squirrel tribes and we little boys for once became useful in shooting them with our bows and arrows we hunted all over the sugar camp until the little creatures were fairly driven out of the neighborhood occasionally one of my older brothers brought home a rabbit or two and then we had a feast i remember on this occasion of our last sugar bush in minnesota that i stood one day outside of our hut and watched the approach of a visitor a bent old man his hair almost white and carrying on his back a large bundle of red willow or kanikanik which the indians use for smoking he threw down his load at the door and thus saluted us you have indeed perfect weather for sugar making it was my great-grandfather cloud man whose original village was on the shores of lakes calhoun and harriet now in the suburbs of the city of minneapolis he was the first sioux chief to welcome the protestant missionaries among his people and a well-known character in those pioneer days he brought us word that some of the peaceful sugar makers near us on the river had been attacked and murdered by roving ojibways this news disturbed us not a little for we realized that we too might become the victims of an ojibwe war party therefore we all felt some uneasiness from this time until we returned heavy laden to our village End of an Indian sugar camp. Recording by Lucretia B.